Welcome to the Alcohol Addiction Podcast. I'm, of course, your host, Lee Davey. And today, for the first time ever, I have a guest who's as scumbaggy as me because he also <laughs> is from the Valleys. Yes! How's it going, man? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good thing. Yeah, uh, Lee, I should say Lee. Now, sorry. Um, yeah, yeah, for, yeah, no, really good. For anyone uh, listening, me and Mags uh, grew up in school together, where everybody knew me as Ching. That was my nickname. So occasionally, throughout this uh, interview, Mags might call me Ching, and I might call him Mags instead of Mark. <laughs> you know, because we're all schoolmates, and we were actually uh, the well, the winners of the Welsh Five Aside competition when we were younger right and we got our photograph up in the in the coveted hall of fame in school do you remember that that's right yeah yeah do you know the first time we actually played football together was down the Ogmo field when he when he came from manchester as well so i remember that well holy crap yeah i was 10 years of age he was like the first person i played football with i remember yeah and, yeah. You, and you were like man you've got to come and play for us you're like cristiano ronaldo <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's fab. Ali, I just want to say it's fantastic what you're doing. And I've been recently really looking at the podcast. It's fantastic what you're doing, honestly. I mean it. Well, it's, good, really to, it's good to get you on because, um, you know, let, let, let's have a bit of backstory here. Me and Mark both come from a little valley in South Wales, uh, which has around 3,000 people roughly, as a population. So the uh, the likelihood that me and Mark or anyone else in the Valley is going to go on and, you know, achieve great things is really difficult. Our uh, choices are limited. Jobs are limited, you know. Uh, prospects are limited. The choices of schools for our children are limited. Like, everything is limited because it's such a small area. And Absolutely. I always have this memory of Mark I used to go to this little town called Bridgend and I would walk through the indoor market with my boy and Mags would always be there trying to sell cable TV to people. <laughs> and I and and I used to think to myself, I wouldn't want to fucking do that job. But he <laughs> always had a smile on his face and he was always happy and he was always kind of upbeat. And then... Years later, because we, we lose touch, I find out that Mark had gone through postnatal depression and had shared his story online. And he wasn't as happy to go looking as I, as I thought he was at the time. He was really struggling. And it ballooned. Mark, it's no exaggeration here, is to say he became the world renowned expert on postnatal depression for men. He started a uh, group called uh, uh, Fathers. Reaching, reaching out, out. fathers reaching out, and really allowed people through his own vulnerability to step forward and say, oh, I didn't even know postnatal depression for a man existed. And he went from being that cable guy to being uh, awarded the Father of the Year Award and the Wales Local Hero at the Pride of Britain Awards in 2012. And he literally has been on every TV show you can think of in the UK. And most recently had a trip to Australia, I believe, right? Yeah, yeah, Australia, I've been in New Zealand, obviously Seattle, America, Canada, so I've done a couple of things out there and uh, radio stations out in Australia, so yeah, yeah, things have every, every, really gone well, but also I was actually diagnosed with ADHD actually at 40 years of age, so it's another thing that people are not aware of, but adult ADHD actually is a condition that you can actually have all your life, you know, as well, so um, yeah, yeah, it's been a bit of a journey, and uh, I'm just yeah, just obviously drink has been a big part of my life as well mm. for 30 years, you know. So um, as Lee, as you just said, you know, growing up, my father was um, a minor. Like I was the first generation not go underground. Mm. So it was basically just drinking and also working. And uh, yeah, it's, like I said, like yourself, Lee, it's socialising around drinking the valleys, you know, which is, uh, as you know, uh, uh, mixing with people I know are uh, actually gone on to alcoholism and actually unfortunately have died as well. So, um, yeah, I've learned a lot from alcohol. It's, it, inter they... it's interesting, Mark. I don't know about you. Uh, well, I do because we mm -hmm. grew up together. But it, it's it's almost like people drink for a variety of different reasons, right? Traumatic reasons or whatever. But for us as kids, we didn't really have a choice, did we? It was just It was just something we did, like breathing air. It was... We all wanted to do it. I see it in my son now. It's this yeah. desire and urge to to be a man and to be grown up and to be cool and to have a drink. And at, at what point did you 
even think to yourself, hang on a minute, this, this isn't right. Can you remember? Well, I, to be honest, there's, there's no, never been a trauma in my life, really trauma, if I'm honest. So, um, my first uh, drink, or actually, a blot of red, actually, was uh, at your, I was only 10 years of age. Um, but believe it or not, my parents actually give, used to give me baby sham as a young kid, you know, even younger, you know, so, you know, probably getting me to sleep. But um, my alcohol really run about teenager mark. Uh, I used to bother with a lot of people older than me, which you you know. And um, yeah, I just, I think I, I would part, I felt being an only child as well, I, I wouldn't really part of anything, really, if I'm honest. But growing up, you know, being a fool and a uh, drink, and I was all, all of a sudden, I was part of something. And um, I think that, uh, um, yeah, it started really from 13 years of age onwards, really. Yeah, um, and, and if you if you decide when you're young to not drink, you you literally are you're on your own. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. everybody everybody just hangs around in the pub. There's nowhere else to hang around in. We 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 yeah. didn't we didn't even have a cinema, <laughs> did we? <laughs> you know? No, 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 <clears throat> no, no. Drinking was on the streets, and uh, you know, uh, kind of um, was it strong brew or uh, I, you know, and uh, twenty twenty mad dog and. Mm. You know, special, you know, after, so yeah, it was a case of like, uh, I didn't know any different really. Um, I didn't certainly get my, I was, you know, obviously looking back now, I was, yeah, low self esteem was a big part, part of it. Obviously, my schooling was very different to schooling now. You know, in um, what I know when, when it's fidgeting and, you know, concentration and uh, part of the ADHD, you know, I'd have a clip across a year and, you know, you'd pick I picked up the cyborgs, as you know, it'd be a cane in primary school and different things. So, so luckily enough, I was um, I was brought into the youth sector, which I'm actually running voluntary now as well. And uh, I think a uh, gentleman, as you know, Stan Norris, actually, I think, saved my life, actually, because it, it could have got a lot worse. Um, I think my sporting, if it went for sport, I think it could have been a lot, lot worse. And, um, and I had good parents. My parents are fantastic parents. You know, and it was just that um, I was just brought up to going, you know, working and drinking on the weekend or... You know, as you know yourself, it was a big part of our lives. Like, so, I I realized at the point of which my marriage was falling apart that if I didn't quit drinking, that is exactly what would happen. My marriage would end, and so I I decided at that point I was going to quit drinking, and that was uh, six six seven years ago now. When was it that you decided first time round to? stop drinking or or did you ever stop drinking did you just reduce did you moderate how did it go for for you um if i'm honest only my wife really knows about my drinking you know i, I drink up to three four bottles a night like uh, especially when my mother was um going all across the france to get drinks so i think it's the um you know looking back it was when i had a breakdown really i had to give up drinking because obviously the medication i was on and obviously the counseling as you know, drink is an antidepressant. I drink with my coping skill throughout my wife's post depression as well. I would um, make sure my, my mother-in-law was uh, looking after the baby because she'd come to live with us, which I'm still getting counselling for now, if I'm honest. You know, I'm joking. <laughs> I had a lot of family support. But, um, but um, you know, it was those times when I'd be drinking on my own. You know, it was my coping skill. I gave a, I gave a smoke in about 12 years ago, and when my son... Obviously, when when my wife was pregnant, I didn't want to smoke because it was save, save money. But as we know, with one addiction, it goes into another addiction, and drink was um, a big part. It's definitely a big part. I've always been. I think thirty years, if I'm honest, I've always had what I now realise a, a problem with drink. And um, you know, even now, my wife would say, you know, if she if she was here now, Mark, you know, <laughs> you got, you have got a, a a not good relationship with drink. You know, I'm not a I think it's a guess. It's gone worse as I got on, if I'm honest. So mm-hmm. The hangover is uh, my motivation around it. Yeah, certainly. You talked a little bit about your breakup there. Um, I've explained a little bit about it in the show notes, but but can you just give us a, a nutshell version of of what kind of happened around the time that uh, Ethan was born? Yeah, yeah. I didn't know nothing about uh, depression, if I'm honest. As you know, I was just very motivation. Um, in sales, you know, I knew about all these good motivation speakers, uh, you know, so I was always very motivated. But when my wife had post uh, well, depression, uh, post depression, at 30 years of age, it happened from a traumatic experience. Uh, I honestly thought my wife was going to die. 
and he saw that my uh, my baby was gonna die. And um, sorry, and um, it was the first time I actually ever had a panic attack. I never had a panic attack ever before. Didn't know what it was, and um, what I know now it was yeah, I had, you know, birth trauma amongst men, which is another thing I'm campaigning for. A lot of fathers are witnessing their loved ones going through this traumatic experience. <clears throat> But it wasn't until my wife had severe post depression where she should have had a mother and baby in it uh, to keep us safe. Um, my world totally changed. You know, I went from um, earning anything for up to £60,000 a year on average to the 25 as, as a sales rep and manager uh, to the point then that, um, you know, I had to give up work for six months, no money coming in. You know, you get used to that lifestyle, then also then yeah, you're totally isolated then. You've got to look after my 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 wife, the baby. No, money worries were starting to come in. You've got a mortgage to pay. The total isolation was unbearable. I couldn't even tell my best friends how I was feeling. Uh, I couldn't tell them about my wife. Because post depression is one of the biggest, um, hardest stigmas because everyone thinks, well, it should be a happy time. You know, you've got a baby, you know, why are you depressed? But it doesn't, it's not like that, you know. Mm. And um, eventually, around about the four-month mark, then, um, I was starting to get suicidal thoughts. I remember walking on a, um, by Cardiff Castle, as you probably know, Cardiff Castle. Yeah, yeah. And I didn't want to make a plan. It was not a plan in place. But I just wanted somebody to hit me, a bus or anything, to hit me, um, to actually stop this mad racing thoughts. Which, um, yeah, just, you know, as, as you know, I, I, I had depression then. But I still carried on, carried on, carried on for well, for for years, really, if I'm honest with you. Mm. And drink was part of that. It was my coping skill. Mark, Mark, can you turn your video off and then back on again? Yeah. Because you just frozen. I think one of the things, uh, Mark, as well, you know, you see I'm just waiting for it to come back on. Mm, yes, I can see you now. I think what, one of the things you said then is uh, postnatal depression is one of the most difficult depressions because you're not really supposed to talk about it because it's supposed to be a really happy time. You have this baby and you feel really bad. Isn't it another issue that you're a man? So, uh, I've, as you know, I've got a four-month-old and... yeah. Every day, I experience a severe amount of guilt that I am not able to drop my work and just go and take care of the baby. And, and, I, and I worry about everything about my wife and my child. And, and when she's only sleeping in two, three hour segments and she's with the baby 23 hours a day, I feel bad just saying I'm tired let alone saying, yeah. I feel depressed. It, was that a real problem for you as well? Well, I think, especially the early years, um, obviously the six months, I was off work for six months. So it was really just me, my wife, and the baby, and my mother-in-law. Um, so I had a lot of time, you know, with my son. Obviously, the bond, as we know, of a bond and attachment is a big, um, you know, uh, that's one thing I did have, you know. It was a good, really good bond. My son still had a fantastic bond with my son. But like you said, sleep. And like you said, what you know, fatherhood has changed now, um, especially from 20 years. My father was growing up. It was just go to work and come home. You know, fathers, there's more stay-at-home fathers now than ever. You know, there's 200,000 single fathers in the UK alone, you know. So you can see how uh, fatherhood's totally changed as well. And a lot of fathers, like yourself, Lee, want, want to spend more time with their son, you know. And unfortunately, um, you know, these... I think mental health around fathers hasn't moved on like it has with women, especially like, you know, it's taken 20 years for them to get this far. So fatherhood or father's mental health that I've been campaigning for is, is very much new, new research. Only new research has just come into, um, come in today. And a lot of uh, fathers I talk to just want to spend more time with their sons or, or daughters, you know, it's changed a lot. So I, I totally get it. And like I said, it's, you, you know, you want to spend more time. And that's that's what I'm finding a lot of fathers. A lot of fathers I feel a pressure now as well to to actually do more overtime. You know, like today now, especially as you know the financial um, cost of having a having any child. But when you've got to overwork, you know, a lot of fathers overworking, and if they got some sort of anxiety in the workplace, now all of a sudden 
they're going to do even more hours and spend more time in the workplace. And, and that affects, obviously, the family. And in fact, my campaign is not just for the father, it's actually for a more family approach. Because if a father is unwell, that affects the mother's mental health. And that also then affects the, the bond and the attachment with the child or so like. So um, it's got to be a more of a family approach rather than just a, a mother at the moment in maternal services. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I, I, it's interesting because when I looked at creating the Needy Helper, one of the things that I considered doing was creating a niche for helping men quit alcohol. And, and to be honest with you, the reason I didn't go down that approach is there are no men out there who are openly wanting to quit alcohol. That's wrong. There are yeah. men out there. But realistically, the, yeah. ones, the ones who are really reaching out are 45-year-old plus women, not men, right? So, you know, you face this problem whereby you can't run a business and pay the bills by helping people who don't yeah. want to be helped. It's, it's such tragic. And I, and I think it goes all the way back to what you were saying earlier that fatherhood isn't like it was before and our fathers before were hard men right it they yeah, they, they they loved us but they didn't show us that that they loved us and we were we were brought up to like be this strong uh pillar in our relationship and to be open or vulnerable or to uh, put your hand up and say uh, i'm really struggling that wasn't yeah. that wasn't allowed was it back then no. No, 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 especially like you said, my, you know, and my father learned off his father as well, you know, it's, it's, it's that generation, you know, yeah. um, fatherhood, you know, like it's the mining, especially at our place, as you know, the mining community was, uh, you know, to come, come out with, with depression was hard now for any man, but then on a father came up, well, yeah, I got postnatal depression, which our father is actually getting diagnosed now at last. The only way I can explain postnatal depression to men is if there was no conception, there wouldn't be no depression for that father in the first year. So it could be a lot of factors. You know, it could be fathers who've had previous mental illnesses like schizophrenia, bipolar, clinical depression. And obviously they're not managing, their, you know, they're managing their mental health fine then. But then the transition into fatherhood, which is stressful and that's, as, it, as we know, on top of that then actually makes their depression uh, come back or unmanageable again. And, and then if you've got a partner who's got post depression, in fact, uh, the research says now at last, uh, last year came out, that 50% of fathers are more likely to have uh, depression just looking after some um, their partners with post depression. But my argument is, is that, okay, but if, what, if there's no support for the father and he ain't uh, getting the right support, then that's going to affect the mother's mental health. So it's got to be up to 50% of mothers are actually getting mental illness as a result of looking after the father. So you can see how I'm trying to change things and there's no mention of the word fathers on the CG1929 guideline. So this is the other thing we need to, you know, I'm hoping to change is I have some sort of uh, guidelines that the father will get the support. One in 10 fathers now is actually properly researched uh, thanks to our friends in Australia. And it's actually down America now that one in 10 fathers will actually suffer from post depression. Mm -hmm. uh, I've done a research paper with the NCT, the National Childbirth Trust, on 2015 on uh, dads in distress. And they actually said that 73% of fathers are worried about their partner's mental health, but 38% of fathers are worried about their own mental health. So, and you can see the suicide rate amongst uh, men is really high around the, this time as well. So, you know, I want to see more research saying how many fathers actually go on to take their, on, take their lives because I wasn't officially diagnosed with post depression. See, because my, my breakdown actually happened six years later, hmm. but I would have been diagnosed as post de depressed. So there's a lot of fathers actually get depression years later because as men, we're supposed to, um, you know, man up, as hmm. we say. And, um, you know, the only time that men actually go and get the help is when he mostly hits crisis point. And they, like myself, uh, went on to have a breakdown where the body just shuts down and you just can't cope anymore. So, you know, there's a lot of good research coming out now. And we're, we're fortunate in the UK that if we do have a, a mental illness or mental breakdown for whatever reason, we're talking about postnatal depression right now, is we can just trot along to the, the doctors at a hospital. We don't... 
I'm not saying the care, the I'm not commenting on the quality of care, but we don't have to pay for it. No. And I imagine if we lived in the States, for example, and you was a man suffering from postnatal depression and you had to pay for your, pay for it, it's it's mm. just one of those things that you're going to say, well, you know, I'm going to, I'm not paying for it. I'm going to man through it, you know? And I think yeah. that yeah. that is a, another difficulty. One of the things I wanted to touch on there that you spoke about, Mark, and, and I, I don't know if you've seen this, is... As you know, um, alcohol destroyed uh, my first marriage, and at, at the time that that happened, I had a choice. I had a choice on my hands, right? I had a ten-year-old son, and the choice was: Do I fight for custody of my son, or do I allow my son to live with his mum? And my intuition, my heart, my gut, everything said. You cannot take away your boy from them from his mom, right? You cannot do that. So I left my boy with his mom, right? I'm open. I'm open. I work again. Okay, we. Uh, can, 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 you can cut that out, can it? Uh, we'll see. I don't care too much. We broke up a little bit. It's not going to spoil the viewing pleasure or the listening pleasure too much. I was just saying, you said there's two hundred thousand single fathers in the UK. I'm one of those. I gave up my boy um, because I felt that it was the right thing to do because I felt that I would rather take on board the heartache than pass it on to his mum. But that in itself then means that as a byproduct of that, I then I then suffer. And I'm not sure that, like, I certainly know that my ex-wife... Uh, doesn't understand that I suffer. She just sees me getting on with my life and thinks that I don't care about my boy and all that kind of stuff. And and that in itself accentuates my pain, makes me feel even worse about myself. Do you get a lot of these single fathers coming forward, not necessarily with postnatal depression, but just with depression? Because they, let's, let's face it, I don't have a relationship with my boy like I should have if I was living with him 24-7, you know? What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, it's funny because my, my work now is actually going into more of that. Uh, now is, obviously, my experience is post depression and father's mental health. And, uh, but what I'm finding now is, is our father's not seen the children and that, you know, they turn to drink, there's drugs, there's anger, there's violence, there's loads of factors. Uh, um, but yeah, I'm certainly seeing a lot of fathers uh, contact me now. I think you probably know of uh, Matt O'Connor, you know, the Fathers uh, for Justice. You know, I, obviously, a couple of years ago, I, I was in a meeting, uh, a conference, which obviously uh, it was our fathers, right? So, yeah, and and I, like I said, I I'm not go, I'm not down that route, you know, obviously, but it certainly is a lot of fathers who are just crying out for help. You know, like, they, you know, they it's affecting their uh, their mental health, you know, mm -hmm. massively, you know, and I can't imagine myself, you know, see, you know, not being able to see my son, you know, on on, a, on on a, a weekly or day, you know, it's hard. For, and a lot of these fathers are not seeing each other like for for months, perhaps sometimes years, you know, I spoke to the fathers, you know. The reason so I can, I totally, you know, I am not had the experience of it, but I, I totally um, understand a lot of fathers who, who just want to see the children and, and it's massively affecting their health. If, uh, if people are wondering what on earth is Lee talking about this for, let me just uh, put some context to this. It's alcohol. The, cr the alcohol creates a division in your relationships if you cannot keep control over it or you can't get help, okay? That then often leads to divorce, right? And I think it's, a lot of couples say, oh, well, you know, it's good that we got divorced because our children were suffering. However, it's very, very unlikely that when you do get divorced, that it will be amicable and everything will be all roses and rainbows Okay, it's more likely that there will be a lot of conflict and a divorce in conflict with children involved means they're going through even more pain than they would if you stuck together. Right now, if if through that conflict, one partner, the man or the woman decides that they're going to use their children as a weapon or they are going to, you know, be obtrusive about allowing their parent to see their child, you know, that is going to create more likelihood of depression, more likelihood of that person returning to alcohol. 
and more likelihood that your children will grow up and turn to alcohol and be poor parents themselves and make poor choices because as role models, you are really setting the wrong example. And I know in my previous relationship and the way that it's gone, one of the things that I really, really find difficult with to forgive myself is that promise that we made, nothing will change. We will still be your parents. And that is bullshit because I don't feel like his parent. I feel like a guy who rents him occasionally like a video and then I have to take him back. And that breaks my heart. And if I, if I was of the constitution where I didn't believe alcohol offered zero value and I was doing this cold turkey, if I was like an AA guy now who was doing this cold turkey, I would have turned to drink so many times because I wouldn't have given a fuck, you know? And and, I, and that's, that's yeah, the yeah. context I'm putting around this. I, I think it's really important that women who are listening to this, who are not allowing their fathers to see their children, I want you to pay attention to this. Now, this is very different than not allowing your parents to, uh, your children to see their parents because they're a risk. I'm not talking about that. Like if if someone is an unsuitable yeah. parent, I, I I get that completely. But, yeah. but but for those that are just falling out because they hate their partner for whatever reason, get past that for the sake of the kids. For God's sake, you can you can yeah be, yeah I, you know totally understand. I do, do you know and I, it is um, it is unfortunate. Fathers actually take their lives because you know in um, because obviously they're not seeing their children and they've actually been good parents or good father. You know so. You know, it's a massive, um, I'm learning about it. I'll be honest, I'm learning more because obviously I'm being drawn in now being this father's mental health campaigner and uh, I'm learning more fathers. It was only, funny enough, only a couple of weeks ago I met up with somebody you know, obviously I'm not going to mention, um, and who's had a, a terrific time, you know, and, you know, and hardworking guy, all he wants to see is children and he'd rather work on the weekends and the only days he gets off to fill that gap, really, you know, mm-hmm. so... Obviously, that's uh, affecting his mental health. He'd rather work seven days a week because it is no uh, purpose in his life. And as we know, with anything, if you haven't got no purpose in your life, you know, uh, and some sort of sense of um, meaning, togetherness, yeah. you know, you know, it's just only one road you're going to go in. So, it's a, it's a, it's, and uh, yeah. it's almost as if it's almost. I felt like I was expected after the breakup to just park my life to one side live next to my boy irrespective of the fact that it's a small little valley where i can't really do anything live there don't have any relationships don't 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 have a life and then just Mm. just just see him once a fortnight and then to actually have a life to decide to live somewhere else to fall in love again to have a new life everyone then looks at you and says you are the worst fucking dad in the world and and I can't think of a worse feeling than thinking that that you're a bad parent. I can't like, I could be a bad husband, yeah. I could be a bad son, but don't say I'm a bad dad. You know, it really like there's something about parenting, you know, that it yeah. hurts. Yeah, like I said, you know, some parents are together and. You know the quality time you don't get with them. You know it's it's um, so yeah. You're right. It's it's far, fatherhood is so complex. It's so many. I'm learning more about fatherhood more more now of speaking. I've been lucky to speak alongside uh, professionals and you know professors uh, in in different types of bond attachment and and uh, fatherhood in general. You know so I'm learning more and more every day and and it's it's so like you said. You know it's it's incredible. I will, when you think of it, I, you know. What you know? Two parents are better than one. Mm. That's what. That's the only way I can explain it. Is two parents are better than one. You know, it's it's got a different outlook. Um, yeah, and things got to change. It's got to change in the UK. It's definitely. And um, I don't want to say like overseas, but certainly things like um, fathers. Fathers, it's got to be more family approach. So yeah, you're right. Yeah, I, and I, I wish I, you know the only way I can ex- you know experience of it, obviously of speaking to the fathers. That's gone through the experience, so uh, it is coming more and more now. The, pa- the, the patterns I see uh, in the needy helper, okay. The pat- there are two patterns I see in the needy helper. One is people give up too soon, and um, John Gottman 
uh, who who writes a lot about marriage and divorce, said that you've really got to give it nine months. You've got nine months of work, nine months of self-discovery, nine months of getting together and, and, and really working hard, right? People give up too easily. That, that's one thing. The other thing is, is there's not a realization normally from the man that there's work to do because the man is programmed to avoid conflict. He doesn't like conflict, whereas the woman is programmed to deal with conflict. So whenever there's an issue raised, the man just says, oh, fuck this. I'm going to go to the pub. Like, I don't want to deal with this. Yeah. And and then over time, the woman kind of just says, well, what's the point? He ain't going to listen to me. And instead of leaving, they live in this horrifically dull, self-destructive relationship. And then what happens? They they just drink. They drink. That becomes yeah. their, that yeah. becomes their buddy. That becomes their With the child they yeah. yeah. From yeah. parents, they, you know, the childhood pack, uh, pack they call it parent and a child. You know, and it, you know, it works two ways. So if you've got a, a wife who's depressed or drinking, obviously that's impact. You know, you'll have a different conversation than than if 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 both were uh, well or, or sober. Like I'd be honest with you. Um, when it comes to the drinking side, obviously um, myself, I, you know, I had counselling uh, with an organisation in Bridgend after after you know I um, was going for the depression, and you know I gave it up for six months. You know, it's, it was something I, I don't know. It's, it's a environment in the valley, or I, I don't know what it is. It's just drawn me back into drinking again. Like, you know, so I think my my life's changed a lot. I think when it comes to the point where you know only last week I realised that I got a good with drinking because. When I had a bottle of wine, and the next day I was, you know, you know, I know the CBT, you know, techniques and all that. I my, I honestly wanted to give up all my work, like that's how bad it was. And I was thinking to myself, you know, I was going to gym one day, I was eating healthy, and this one bottle of wine, I've actually made a decision that I was going to give up my work, you know, because mm. this paranoid thought in my mind was saying, Mark, oh, you're not good enough again, all this. But but that's how bad it's got, you know. I told to myself, what's it going to be, a bottle of wine or carry on? And, and the next five years of my life, uh, I can see this vision of where I want to be. And the only thing that's stopping me is drinking. So, you know, um, and it's a big relief for my wife. I think she realizes now after this time, I, I, I just really want to stop drinking. You know, I'm not dependent on alcohol. Um, uh, there's times when I could have been, if I'm honest, definitely, 100%. You know, I've... I've Sadly, um, you know, I was a bear in a friend's phone gallery last year. You know, he was only late 30s and he died for drink. I was nursing him with his mother, obviously, for the last two months of his life. And I've seen what alcohol can do with the psychosis of it. It's absolutely, it's absolutely, absolutely horrendous, like, you know. Um, I'm finding out now that uh, there's a lot of dementia around alcohol, young age, you know, as well, for drink. And, you know, so I, I can see the, the bad sides of it, actually, you know, um, and I can't see, I've come, come to a point in my life now, the the benefits of it is actually, I can't see any benefits anymore, no. whereas I could before. Yeah. I, you know, I, I go across drinking, uh, going across in a car, and it's not like, even though I'm not independent on alcohol, I just want to have a drink for any reason. I want to just, you know, Go past the shop. I think I'll just, yeah, I just want to get a bottle of wine or two bottles of wine. You know, you know, when, when you come to the point where you're drinking and you're on anxiety, you're thinking, oh, I got enough in my enough to last me all night. I mean, that's when it starts uh, makes you think more and more, like you know, and and uh, you know, after 30 years now, I've come to the thing where there's two ways I'm gonna go. I can either, you know, go along with what people in that, you know, my friends. I don't. I like to think they're not. It's a, I go, it's hard to say, you know, you, you lose this, um, you know, I like to think I'm not going to lose any friends, okay, but, you know, my personality would be a lot different when I go out with them, you know, and uh, that's what, you know, that's what I'm getting with I think one of the things that makes it easier when we get into our 40s is our friends, large majority of them have, have all kind of got wives and uh, or husbands and kids, so that. Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night, all day Sunday thing that yeah. we used to do in the valley is not there as much. Let me, let me ask you a question: Are you are you thinking of moderating, or are you thinking of 
just never drink it again. No, no. It, I, I'm an all or nothing. I am. I, I realise. Uh, in fact, I might actually bring my wife in for a quick final chat to explain how bad it is. I think. Um, uh, I'm, you know, same as smoking. I give up smoking, and funny enough, it was only the Wales England game, and we lost against England. And I was drink, I was drunk out of my head, and it was the first time I had a fag, a cigarette. Mm. So, you know, and I haven't smoked for 12 years. So, you know, I totally lost all, you know, why you know, I gave a smoke in the first place. And, and I know it, it's, then, you know, if I'm honest, I never, I don't know if you know yourself, that, you know, for seven years, it hasn't been just about drink. It's been about antifetamines and, and drugs as well, you know, mm. smoking cannabis. And so, so, so I know I've got some sort of like addicted personality and, um, and what I find it's funny, what you know, you talk about the sugar addiction. It's funny when I was um, on Saturday, Sunday night actually, Thursday night I had a bottle of wine. On a Sunday night, I just wanted another bottle of wine, and I was going into depressed mode. Like I said, I thought, oh, I saw this work, I can't do it anymore. I don't want to do it. And and um, for some reason, I just went out the back and just grabbed a load of biscuits and started eating them. And I was feeling feeling better. And I think self harm. We talk about self harm as people think it's cutting. It. It's all sorts of self harm. You know, anything that takes you away from emotional feeling and hurting your body or in some sort of way is a form of self harm. Um, so, you know, I realise that if I drink, that means then the next day I don't go to the gym. I eat rubbish. Then uh, it goes into a vicious cycle. And I'll I'll stop it on Monday. Uh, and then I'll, I'll go to the gym again, and it's only when I stop drinking completely is when I'm really, actually, really focused on going to the gym, and my mental health is, is prime. You know, I think, I think to being diagnosed with ADHD was a big thing at the, in the impulsiveness. So I know, um, you know, if it is a bottle of wine in the house, I wouldn't even think I'd just go and grab it and drink it. Like um, I'm learning more about condition of ADHD more and more. I want to ask you a little bit about where you are now and. You're drinking just prior to you, your decision to quit, if you don't mind, because I think this is an important point that I want to probe. I talked ab- ab- about seeing you as a salesman um, selling cable TV, right? And as much Me? as. Oh, sorry, boy. Can I just tell him my son is singing away like a canary is? <laughs> I'm just going to tell him that uh, I'm going to What's that? You done? I'm just doing an interview with you. All right? Say hello. Hello. <laughs> Can I say hello to Lee? Hello. He's an interview he is for his podcast. Okay. Say hello. Hello. Hello, Ethan. How's it's it going, a, buddy? He's a Cardiff City fan, he is. He's a what fan? He's a Cardiff City fan. Oh, well, you know, he can't help himself, yeah. can he? Sorry, man, Lee. Sorry. So, yeah. so you're selling cable TV and as much as you look to me like you're enjoying it and I knew you was a really good salesman... I'm kind of guessing that your meaning and purpose in life wasn't to be the greatest salesman in the world, right? And then all of a sudden, you find this thing happen to you, this hurricane, where you start writing about your postnatal depression and Good Morning TV are inviting you to talk. You're, you're going to go to see the bloody queen. There's all these things that start happening. And you all of a sudden, it feels like from the outside that you're in your element that you found meaning and purpose being you are now going to give your life to service and you're going to help other people um, discover and deal with mental health. Now, I run a training course where I help people who quit alcohol fill their white space by finding meaning and purpose because I think if you don't have meaning and purpose, then you are more likely to relapse, right? But here we have somebody who's found their meaning and purpose, but somewhere along the line, it seems like it's got a little bit overwhelming and even though you're on the right path and you're happy that you're on that path, something unusual has happened. Can you talk about that a little bit yeah. more? Yeah, what it, what it is, my mind's constantly racing all the time, unfortunately. Um, I get ideas constantly all the time. So when I um, when I started, I think part of my recovery was uh, this purpose. I said a father reaching out. I think it was a massive purpose. I was in a gym one day, I spoke to this guy, I was in recovery, I was on medication. Sorry, I'm going to really... So yeah, so I was, um, I was back, I was in a gym one day and all that, and this guy said to me, side by side, he said, look, you know, i got to go to NHS prams, and I, uh, I said, okay, he said, my wife's got post-depression, 
And I said, no way. I said, my wife had posted in pressure. And so all of a sudden, we had talked side by side. I realised this gentleman lost everything. He had a breakdown looking after his, uh, his wife. He unfortunately witnessed his father hanging 20 years ago, and he contained that for 20 years. But when his wife had posted in pressure, it was different things. So and I asked him, was there anything out there? And he said, no, nobody's ever asked me how I was feeling. So when from that conversation, I went out to set father reaching out, and all of a sudden, the media got involved. And obviously, like you said, I was been on radio stations and TV. But I had a five-year plan, believe it or not. I had a five-year plan. And that five-year plan actually came ahead um, in December. I spoke in the House of Commons in Parliament. And my paper was, luckily, I worked with a lady called Dr. Jane Hanley. And she does all the referencing and, and, um, and the work alongside me. Whereas I'm with the academic side, she actually brings it to life. And, you know, we went in the nursing times. I, I'd obviously seen the, the BBC Victoria Derbyshire show. I was on there with another father with post impression. All this in the, in the space of the five years. And all of a sudden, my, it was like, okay, I've just travelled around the world. I've, you know, you know, my work's now known uh, all around the world. And all of a sudden, it's like, God, what am I going to do next? And that's where the big thing was. What am I going to do next? Like, um, and like I said, filling that gap um, has been massively massive for me. I think uh, I think it was part of my recovery. I'll be honest. If it weren't for that gap, uh, I think I could have um, my my mental health would it wouldn't have been as quick as it had been. Like you know, and um, unfortunately, like I said, the drink drink was still part of my life then. Like you know, it was, it was still part of my life. But I think this time. I, I've got a new five-year plan or 10-year or 20-year plan now, and it's totally different. And it doesn't involve drink. I think I think I, w- I like this. What I want to, um, like I said, serve other people to say, look, if I can do it, you can too. So more or less on the motivation route as well. So if somebody has got depression, you know, use it and educate people in school or if it's, um, um, you know, in workplaces. And I want to, I want to, yeah, I've, I've just got a different different plan now. But I know for a fact if I keep drinking, I'll, my motivation won't be as good as if it is mm-hmm. if I if I don't if I don't give up. Sorry. I I want to mention something there for people listening. I've just finished reading a book by Eric Rice called The Lean Startup, and uh, Eric Rice it's a business book about startups, obviously. And I was reading it because Needy Helper is in, in effect a startup, right? And what Eric Rice teaches is to experiment in business. But you can, there are parallels in life, right? So what I get from Eric Rice is, is he says, you experiment in business and you see if things work. And if they don't work, you listen to the feedback and you adjust and then you tweak and then you experiment again and then you keep going. But at some point in life, you have to make a decision about whether or not you're going to persevere in that business or you're going to pivot and take a different angle, right? And we can use the same analogy in life, right? So I teach people to find meaning and purpose in life, right? But I also stress to people that this doesn't have to be a a, a long, you know, until you're in the grave thing. There are times in your life where you will feel like you're on point, that you're rocking and rolling on your meaning and purpose, and then something will happen and you have to make a decision whether you're going to persevere or pivot. And don't beat yourself up if you suddenly decide that this isn't what you want to do and you want to pivot and do something else. Yes. And it's the same in your relationships. Don't persevere in your relationship if it's dragging you down and you've tried for nine months to try to fix it. Pivot. Take a a leaf out of Don Don Miguel Ruiz's book, Mastery of Love. Respect the person that you're with by leaving them and finding somebody else who matches you better so they can find somebody who matches them better i I just thought of that then so maybe mark you know when you when you had your five-year plan it sounded like you instead of making service a life orientation you made it a five-year plan and then when it ended it was like yeah yeah what am i going to do now so (laughs) what's what's going to be different other than not drinking alcohol what's going to be different if you do another five ten year plan I, th- I think um, I, I very much structured it. Yeah. I, I think um, I, I might be going off off, off a bit there. I realise now I, I, there is very a lot of autistic uh, traits in my in my condition. Uh, 
So I got lists, I got concert lists, I got ticket, I got to do it. And even before I started, uh, I looking back to the breakdown, you know, I, I was bored. Boredom is massive for me. I've mm. got to be doing something. Boredom mm. is massive. Uh, so looking back up to 37, you know, I was doing this good money, um, but I was look, I was doing anything just to fill that gap. Anything. So, you know, I drive a Ferrari on a sports day. I'm no interest in cars. I'm not materialistic, mm. but it was something I had to do, like, you know, mm. so tick this, tick this. Yeah. I thought that the meaning of life was just to, just do loads of things. Uh, and I realize now that it's not about doing loads of things. It's doing things that you love in smaller quantities now, you know, and, and uh, I've learned about mindfulness. Um, so I'm, I'm going to go back to do mindfulness, but, uh, Teaching people about, um, you know, meditation, that's the other thing that I feel helped me, you know, in the early years, especially. So it's not just about motivation speaking and all that. I, I can see my whole life as not about doing loads and loads of things, but doing smaller things, but in a small, um, more proactive way. And, um, I'm still learning. I'll be honest with you, you know, I'm 43 now, next. I'm still learning. I realize that, um, I may go off on different areas, but it's part of my brain saying, look, um, you know, it, it, it's funny to explain um, my way my brain works is that it's constantly ideas, ideas, ideas all the time. And the only way that I could control all the stopping voices, in, in, a, in a sense, was using drink. That's the only time um, that, you know, that those voices actually disappear in a way. In a way. Mm -hmm. uh, people think about schizophrenia, you know, it's not, it, it's, it's like my mind's constantly racing. So with mindfulness, it, it, it does help. Like so your 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 plan just to uh, make people aware of this is you're you're going to quit drinking alcohol, which in effect allows you to control the ADHD in a way. Because what what's happening is your your mind's whirring under mile an hour, and you're all right when you've got stuff to do. But all of a sudden, when you're bored, you've got nothing to do, and these voices are telling you, "Oh, you're not good enough. You haven't got this shit figured out." Absolutely. And that. Um, all these people and I guess as well Mark when you when you went f through this hurricane and you went from selling cable to the Houses of Parliament I imagine you had a lot of people around you in the field of mental health who had gone through some serious academical <laughs> academic studies who had like all yeah. these different names behind them and letters and you're thinking to yourself I'm just Max from Ogmore Vale and that, that must have had a bit of an impact didn't it? You know, it's funny. It's funny because when I was in Melbourne, um, two years prior to the Marseille, Marseille conference is massive. I was probably the non, first like, non academic actually to actually speak about, um, any subject. The Marseille conference and two years, Dr. Jane Hanley, she, she said, Mark, will you be, a, uh, one of the sp speakers there, um, primary, sp um, speakers, whatever. And, um, I, I actually walked out. I was, bear in mind, I was, I was happy speaking um, in organisations, football clubs, and different things, and, and prisons, but I didn't think I was good enough. And the one reason why I did go to Australia because I realised that I, I was good enough. I think that, you know at then, and the biggest joy I've had was walking actually down from the conference. I left early actually from uh, Melbourne, the conference in Melbourne, and uh, it was like it was like a million pound worth of therapy just in one one hour. It was like oh my gosh. These academics, these people, professors uh, from around the world, right? You know, I was on stage with some Australia, New Zealand, uh, America, all, you know, Canada. And I was the only one from the UK speaking to my father. It's like, you know, so, so yeah, it was, it was uh, and because I think the reason why I know so much about father's mental health, because my communication skills from sales have made me open these guys up even more than the academic. Hmm. So, you know, and I got the information out there. So, my 12 years of sales, um, you know, I'll give an example. When I talk to a father, I don't say, are you going to go to the GP? Mm. I say, no. When's best year? When are you going to go to the GP, John? Monday or Tuesday? Mm. So I tweak it like I do with Sky. When do you want Sky for it? Yeah, yeah. Basically, ra rather, than, rather than selling him cable, you're selling him the idea that he needs to get his shit in order and help himself. So what you're talking about here, are you saying that, throughout this journey that you've suffered a little bit from imposter syndrome? I said, say again? Have you, are you saying that you suffered a little bit from imposter syndrome? You look around sometimes and you think, I don't belong here? 
Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, um, I think it's a different feel I'm in now. I think now I'm more accepted now, you know, people actually, um, I don't, I know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell them again next week, uh, speaking at the BGM. So if you look at the, uh, you know, list, it's incredible, you know, with all these uh, people, OBs and, you know, MDs and dames and all this, and, uh, and there's little Mark Williams from Obermobile, you know, uh, speaking of my father's, you know. So, but I'm, I'm, I'm totally... I'm around that circle now. I think I think because I know it's right. I know what I'm saying because it's actually come from the horse's mouth. These fathers have actually opened up to me. I think part of the reason why they've opened up to me too as well is because they know I've gone for the experience. Yeah. And they totally get it as well. Yeah. I think that's really been a massive thing as well. And obviously, I'm more um, when I first started, I was I was educated to a certain level, but now working with Dr. Jane Hanley and another professor and doctors, whatever, I'm listening to them and I'm being around meetings and. And speaking on their platform, my education is just, you know, I didn't know nothing about bond and attachment, you know, mm. you know, four years ago. Now I know, I'm, I'm knowing how important that is, you know. So, so yeah, it's, yeah, it's been a journey. I'm still on our journey, but I think um, my low self-esteem coming from school, if I'm honest, mm. massively, uh, looking back. I think, as we know, you know, I, I, love, I left school with no qualifications. So when you're totally thick and stupid and, you know, and, um, because I, I just couldn't concentrate. I wasn't interested in the subjects. You know, if, if, I, if you give me a book on my mental health, I, I look at it, I like psychology, I can see it, I can, you know, I'm doing a project now. I look at it differently than, than I would, you know. So um, I think school had a massive part of my life. I think I had learning, you know, I had speech therapy when I was five years of age, I don't know. You, um, you, you used, when I first met you, you had a stutter. I, I, yeah, I, yeah. Yeah, yeah, slight stutter, yeah. Speaking very fast and all oh. that. And, um, so, you know, yeah, you know, I've learned to, obviously, I still get it when I get excited sometimes, but I, there's certain words I can't say now. And also, I was diagnosed, uh, I found out with the ADHD that I was diagnosed with dyslexia, moderate dyslexia. So what you find with ADHD, you've got the condition, and what stems from it is the anxiety, depression, low self-esteem, uh, dyslexia, mental OCD. So sometimes we treat the actual uh, depression or anxiety, but really we don't treat the condition mm. as well. You know, we can treat the condition. So, so I'm learning, and I think um, I don't know if you know that I. It took me three years to actually get a proper diagnosis because they they tried to diagnose me with a bipolar. Now the reason behind that was after two and a half hours, I was with this one psychiatrist. Unfortunately, my wife was there. My mother had done the tests and everything. You know, it's got to be present in childhood, school, and all that. I've done the tests and all that. And the gentleman said, yeah, I've got ADHD. And fortunately for me, that psychiatrist after 30 years left. And you can imagine when I went into the room and with that on my own, with a hoodie on, with Winner Boys and Girls Club on it. And I said, no, oh, so he said, what do you do, Mr. Williams? I said, oh, I speak around the world. I speak around the world. Oh, no. I didn't speak around the world then, sorry. Uh, oh, I work with so-and-so. I, you know, I'll be on TV. And I'm really excited. And all that. he thought I was having some sort of manic episode. Like <laughs> right. So then... <laughs> so sometimes when we present to psychiatrists, or it's totally different to you know that's another, that's another area you know. But I'm learning about. Um, but yeah, it's been a bit of a journey, but a good journey as well. Yeah. What is uh, what is mental illness, Mark? Because when I was a kid, if someone would have said, whenever we l wanted to say something derogatory to someone, we would say you're mentally ill, like you're, you know, you 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 yeah. yeah, you're a mental case, and there was. There's such a stigma to that word. What does it? What does it mean? Does it? How? How much does it encompass? What is it? Well, the only way I'm trying to break this uh, stigma is, you know, but we all got mental health. All of us, you know, we all got mental health, and the only way I can describe it, we got good mental health or bad mental health. So, you know, I'm doing a project now where we're trying to do physical health, and mental health, the same side, you know. So. If you haven't got your mental health, you won't have your physical health, you know. So, you know, when I just, you know, when I um, when I was depressed, when I had my breakdown, I just won the pretty Welsh kickboxing over to 35 tournament, you know. I was going for my black belt, you know, then. But my mental health was suffered, suffered, suffered. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, to the point where I didn't have my, you know, I broke down, you know. So mental health is everyone, all I can say is, there's not one person going through the same sort of, you know, same sort of mental health, depression, or mm. there's low, there's high, there's moderate depression, you know, and some people can get out of it. 
some people, you know, is low mood. Unfortunately, um, we give medication or counselling, but sometimes that person may not need that medication, or they may, you know, need CBT. One may need DBT. One need mindfulness. So unfortunately, you know, we're trying to change that to where the GPs will say, okay, let's have a look at that area. What's what's good for you? What what what? It may be a case that there's no purpose in his life. Hmm. You know, his job. You know, but that is affecting the mental health. We need to start listening to the person rather than what we assume with sometimes as, as, as you know, so in my situation is I got to keep my ADHD in, in check. Otherwise that will affect my mental health as well. So, hmm. um, it's so, it's such a complex area of mental health. It's unbelievable. It's not one person I feel is the same hmm. because sometimes it's trauma in their lives as well. You know, we don't realize I didn't have no trauma in my life. But some people go through a lot of trauma in lives, and it's a massive. Some of the stories and people I work with. Well, it's interesting because we we often think of trauma as physical abuse or rape or sexual abuse or something. But it sounds like you did have trauma when you was going through school. So the way that the teachers yeah. were were teaching you, you, you say about the sideburns. I mean, that's got to be Alan Evans, right? <laughs> I I I've been pulled yeah. up by yeah, my yeah. sideburns by yeah. Alan Evans plenty of times. So. I know what you're saying. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. Did, I didn't want to mention his name. <laughs> I, just, I just outed him. I just outed him as, as uh, being responsible for mental illness in South Wales. No, Alan, you're a lovely fella. You're a lovely fella. <laughs> no. and, and, a, and a great actor. Because <laughs> he, he was Fagan in Oliver Twist. Um, just want to ask you one more question before I let you go, Mark. You're just about to embark on this new, this new journey, this new pivot, and alcohol is not going to pay a part in your life. I know how difficult it is to quit alcohol. What's your plan? What's your strategy? How are you going to quit? Are you going to go cold turkey? Are you going to come to the needy helpers for some help? Are you going to join AA? What's your plan? Yeah, I, I think um, well, part of the reason why I've been in touch with recently because obviously I made that decision I could come on this. And um, I, I think, like you said, the thing about the AA as well, I'm, I'm not that, you know, I'm not a I don't I, I if I'm honest, uh, only my wife will actually know. And I, and I like before you go there, you'd actually speak to my wife as well, because not a lot of people know after 20 years what she is, knows about me, really, because everyone sees me as a happy, you know, go lucky guy and all that. I like it really to bring it in, and she will explain how bad my, you know, my alcohol it really is, you know. And, and um, but I, I, I just want these, I got, I got the coping skill, I know where I want to go. Um, I know alcohol dependent, but I just need more education around alcohol and what stopped me. So anything, really, you know, and I, like I said, you know, I've seen how, what alcohol can do to people. You know, I, like I said, earlier on, but um, I just know that I need as much support as I can because it's when you embrace, I, I'll embrace support from any, anywhere. Like, you know, um, I, I think I got to take responsibility. Once you start taking responsibility yourself, I think that's, that's half a battle then. I think in what I work in mental health now, you know, I can give people the tools, but they've got to, you know, take it on themselves to actually go and take that responsibility to change as well. I really want to change. I don't want to spend the next 30, 40 years of my life thinking, oh, I wish I'd done now because, um, it's basically because this one bloody bottle of shit, you know, mm -hmm. uh, or tool or free, whatever. Track, uh, track Michelle in and So I just think that, um, my life, you know, life can be a lot better without it. Yeah. Drag Michelle in then. Yeah, yeah. Is that okay? Mm. If you're listening on the yeah. audio right now, we're just going to get Mark's uh, wife, Michelle, to chat with us for a little bit. I'm going to ask her what it's like to live with someone who has an alcohol issue and might not realize that they do have an alcohol issue because I think that will be an interesting conversation to have. And I'm sorry about these little breakups, but I hopefully uh, the whole experience I'm is working. I'm just getting um, Michelle over here. Okay. Michelle, All right. <laughs> Hi, Michelle. Take a seat. Get in the hot seat. She's not used to Skype me, so just lay down. So. Okay. I don't, right? Yeah, I don't know if Mark's told you, but you are actually live on the podcast right now, right? So... All right. I just want to. I just want to ask you. Mark was telling me about his drink uh, and drink being a problem, and being from the valley myself, 
been in that same situation. I know what it's like. But I wanted to ask you, for the people listening, what does it feel like to be with someone that you can see alcohol has taken control and is turning the person you're with when it does take control into someone that, you know, you'd rather he wasn't. And he doesn't really understand that his problem is as problematic as you do. What well, What is that like? And talk a little bit about that. Um, I think it's, it's like um, there's two different people. There's one Mark with uh, the drink and there's Mark with the drink. And that's all he can think about is have a, if you if you go out, um, he can't just have one, and he's probably had one before um, you've got to the bar. You know, he's really can he go to he go and drink? Because all he can think about is having that drink hmm. and drinking as much as he can until he's really drunk. Mm-hmm. So you can if anywhere we go out, it's not about being together. That is about him having as much drink as he can and getting a drunk as he can. You know, mm-hmm. so it, it's just he just focuses on on the drink more than then being with you, you know, and enjoying enjoying himself with you. It's more about just the drink, you know. And how how has that made you feel and how have you been able to communicate with him to get him to change? Um, well, it's, uh, Mark's had drink in his life, all his life. Um, he, his socialisation is with, with drink, you know, his friends drink. He, he drinks, he associates a good time with having a drink. Hmm. And I, I think we we try and to now sort of go out and have a good time without him having to have a drink. I, I do feel a lot of the time that, um, like, he can't go out without having a drink. And even in the house, he, he can sometimes he has a bottle of wine and that's all that matters then is him with that bottle of wine. So then there's no... no communication then so it is, it is difficult but he's um sometimes and he, he doesn't know when to stop so he can sometimes he can carry on drinking um until he can't walk and, and you know you know things like that so mm-hmm. it's, yeah it's, it's, it is difficult he's he's a lovely person he's so bubbly and character without having a drink so he doesn't doesn't really need it but he, he feels he does sometimes did you create an ultimatum? Did you create boundaries and say, look, Mark, I don't want this in my life anymore? Or did Mark himself realise that he was impacting the relationship because of his choices? I think he, he's um, realised the drink is not good for him. Once he's had a drink, everything goes out the window. He starts eating unhealthily. He's, the next day, he's in a really bad mood. Um, it, it just doesn't affect, it's not just on the night, it affects his whole, uh, the, his mood, his health, everything. He gets snappy uh, when he's got a hangover, you know, it affects everything. So I think him, he's realised himself, I think. Hmm. Um, we have had plenty of arguments and most of them are over his drink. Um, and most of the, the arguments are that he... He has about five drinks before everyone's had one, and and you know, and then the way he behaves when we're out, everyone thinks is oh, funny Mark, you know, jokey Mark. But when you when you're out for somebody like that, sometimes it can be frustrating, and and you're the one then have to sort of take him home and put up with like the hangover the next day, and put up with him being miserable, you know. Yeah, so, I, I I be I be there. You you start to you start to develop a feeling of shame and a f- almost embarrassment when you go out because you know that this behavior is going to happen. Jekyll or Hyde, I don't know which one's the bad guy, but you know it's coming and you start to think, oh no, and you can't enjoy yourself, I guess. So so do you don't drink or you drink moderately? I don't. Um, I've never been one to drink in the house. Yeah, I'd rather a cup of tea in the house, to be honest. So, so I don't, I don't drink in the house. When I go out, I'd like to have a drink. Hmm. Uh, when social, I'm over a social drinker, you know. When if I go up with my friends or me and Mark go out to have a drink, um, and Mark's always been like, oh, if I only have a couple of drinks, he's like, oh, come on, what's wrong with you if you're not drinking loads, you know? So it's like encouraging me to drink because he wants to drink, you know. And then 
making me feel like I'm the bad one if I don't want to get absolutely drunk, you know? Yeah, yeah. no, I get it. And... But he, you know, when he, I'm not saying when, he, when, he, when he's drunk, he's, well, and when he's sober, he's, he's fine, you know, he's a good laugh, and, but it, it does get a bit tiresome when it's all the time, and when it's like he, he kind of neglects me then mm. when he's when he's drinking mm. because he just wants to go and drink and have fun and I'm not against that you know I like to have a drink and have fun as well mm. but it, it is like I'm not there I could not be there you know yeah yeah so it is you know it's kind of like you're out together but you're not out together yeah it's, you know he's just focused on as much as he can drink you know? yeah it, it actually I imagine you start to think why well, I don't want to go out because I, I'll be too busy watching what you're doing and worrying about what you're doing. I can't enjoy myself. Whereas hopefully in the future when Mark quits, you'll be able to find something that you can both do together that you enjoy that has a shared meaning and purpose that doesn't involve drink. You know, because mm. you, you're right. I, I, I don't think when he stops, I don't think he will want to go to the pub with the guy, you know, with the guys. I think he will just be wanting to get away from that. So I think... I think the challenge that you have on your hands is actually, yeah, filling up his space with stuff to do that doesn't involve drink because, as you know, he's 100 miles an hour, so. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> I think it's just been, that's what he's been brought up with and that's what he's used to. And, the valley life. And that's the first thing he turns to if he's on a stressful day. Mm. So it's like a coping mechanism as well, yeah. you know? Yeah. Michelle, um, thank you very much for joining us. Is he still there? He's yes, he's you. Yeah, drag him in. Just get him in. Drag him in. Thanks, Michelle. Thank Cheers. Oh, thanks, Leah. I don't. I didn't catch all of it, but uh, I just wanted. I, I don't think that uh, all my friends realise. Only Michelle really, really realizes. You know, and it, is, and it does affect her, and that's part of the reason why. I just, I just want, I want to, yeah, I just want to change my whole lifestyle, really. I think part of the problem is a little bit like, you know, you were talking earlier on about postnatal depression and not being able to talk to somebody ab about it because they, they wouldn't understand it or you feel like um, you lose some of your manliness or whatever. Quitting drinking when you live in the valley is quite similar because what I found when I quit, when I was telling my friends that I was an alcoholic, they were looking at me and saying, no, you're not an alcoholic. That you, you're just one of us and you could see in their faces shock that if I was saying that I had this real problem and they were drinking the same if not more than me then to associate themselves with me and to acknowledge that would to be acknowledged they had a problem and it was easier to just just leave leave me alone not call me anymore yeah. not not go out with me anymore because then they don't have to confront their own issues and I mean, just, just even the other day, you know, I, I wrote a long blog post on my birthday on Facebook, you know, and just to say, you know, I'm really glad I'm sober and how much things have changed now I'm sober. And, and even then someone writes on there, yeah, do you remember that time you got really pissed in a casino in Vegas and was wheeling around in a wheelchair? Trying to like, yeah, that moment was fun. No, it wasn't fucking fun. I was being wheeled around yeah. a wheelchair in Vegas after being naked in front of, it wasn't <laughs> fun. And... To change that mindset is really, really difficult. Oh, Lee. Lee, Lee, honestly, one of the worst things, you know, I flooded a bed, a bed, a hotel in Western Superman, like, you know, my friend laughed well now, but I was so drunk in the afternoon, you know, I left the taps on and I mm. flooded the hotel. And it's, uh, you know, I've been mean, uh, done for drink and dry, um, just like drink and dry, I drank this all day three times in the mm. past. You know, I woke up in a, in a police cell, you know, uh, thinking I kept my bedroom wiped, and, you know, so, um, it's always been part of me, you know, urinating in a public place because I drink, you know. Uh, all the bad things I've done, um, you know, because I, obviously I have done a lot of bad things, um, you know, and I haven't heard anyone, but a lot of bad stuff, I think, oh, I could have done a bit better and worry about it then. Um, it's always been drink, you know, it's always hard, you know, in Michelle, mm -hmm. my relationship, Michelle, everything that um, has affected us is, is because of drink, like, you know. Mm -hmm. And she's, I mean, we're 20 years now, and, she, you know, sometimes she's put up with me, you know, um, I don't know she's, what she said, but I've been drinking a bottle of wine. And to myself, you know, it's affected me as a father as well, because sometimes I could be put my son to bed, and all I'm thinking about is that bottle of wine. 
Or, or, you're well, putting, I, or you're putting him to bed. You don't even know you're putting him to bed because you're in black. I'm not in a mindful moment. Yeah, yeah. I'm not in a mindful moment. It's part of me. My brain is telling me the bottle of wine downstairs. Yeah. So I would really just get him you know, to bed as quick as I can. Like, you know, it's all, right. And then I can agitate it. And then I think, oh, why is he going to sleep? Because really, the back of my mind, my, somebody is telling me there's a bottle of drink downstairs. You know, so it's affecting all parts. And, you know, looking back, and I have looked back recently, you know, it's, I can't see, well, certainly now I can't see any positive signs, you know. Um, I think it's, 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 it's come to the point now, I think, you know, I mean, um, I, you know, he's like moving away, you know, he's talking about moving the valleys. And part of the reason why I want to move away is not because I want to move away from, because I've got a good life where I am and stuff. Because like you said, you know, this everyone talks about drink in the valley, so the night out is, a, is is having a drink. But I'm going to, I, I want to change that, um, my mindset environment environment is absolutely kit critical uh mags i've taken up enough of your time i just want to end by um just saying thank you for being brave enough to open up your laptop and start telling the world your most personal and private intimate details not even knowing that anyone was going to read them and then all of a sudden having to deal with this almost celebrity status that was thrust upon you and and i want to thank you for doing that because i believe that you have affected and and helped save the lives of thousands of men around the world who have now feel confident enough to come forward and share their um stories as well so I want to thank you for that, and I want you, oh, thanks, you know, and I want to thank oh. you for choosing to quit alcohol, so you can keep doing that, but doing it with a more renewed, laser-like focus, because you won't have this poison dragging you down. So, Mark, I want to thank you for that. I want to thank you for being a guest on the the Needy Helper podcast. Yeah, thanks, Lee. Thanks. Brilliant.